it's a doomsday missile actually. And the creation of this missile and the functioning of this missile it, it is carried out in five vertical silos within that company. And so the individual who's working in silo number one has no idea what goes on in silo two, three, four, and five. And if this guy in silo one rises to power in charge of all of the project, he's skewed in the way that he views the, the, the silo arrangement because he thinks where he came from is the most important. My son sits over top of all five silos. So he looks at all of it in tandem and, 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 and this is what, this is the relationship I want to show you. There's more silos here than three. But, but in order to uh, try to bring some additional, to pr try to bring some revelation and to put things in context, uh, I've picked three things that are fairly critical. The, the Romans road, and I'm just, gonna, I'm just going to uh, preface this with, it's a sacred cow. I'm going to show you that it's been around for only 70 years. You may think 70 years is a long time. Well, 2,000 plus years is when Jesus released the gospel. So 70 years is nothing in the scheme of things. It's a relatively new invention, and I'm going to show you why it was created. And we're going to go into Romans, and we're going to dive into Romans and see what is actually Paul saying. And, 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 and when I show you it, hopefully what it starts to flush out is, wait a minute, there's no such thing as a simple little pattern of prayer that I can walk up to somebody and they can say and get saved. It doesn't exist. And, but yet there are things going on, and if you understand the nature of ministry, you're going to be able to recognize somebody who's ready to receive the Lord. And you're going to understand that you've played a critical role in getting them to that threshold. Um, but because that is such a sacred cow, and many of us have used it, you could find and draw offense to the fact that I may come against it and speak against it, and you might go, wait a minute, you just trashed 20 years of my ministry. <laughs> and, and I am not saying at all that you can't get saved by the sinner's prayer. I'm not saying that. But, but what I am saying is it is not a biblical pattern of ministry that we can find reference here that we should take with us out into the field. And what I want to do is start to introduce where it came from, why it came, and, and, and dive into Romans and show you what's really going on in Paul. But then when we shift over to the ministry of the forerunner and we break that out briefly, you're going to start to see some similarities between what I'm revealing to you in Romans and what I'm revealing to you in the, in the ministry of the forerunner. Then when we ju jump down to, to Jesus Christ and his ministry, you're going to say, oh, wait a minute, I see this connection weaving through it. And now I'm starting to see that there's a pattern of ministry that's available to me. And it's not only available to you, it's required of you. Right? It's required of you. You are the ministers of God. You're the right hand of Christ on earth. Um, you're stewards of the gospel, but you're stewards of Jesus' actual ministry. You're his agent and representative. It's, it's absolutely no different then uh, when, my, when my mother fell gravely ill, I had power of attorney. When I went to the bank, I was Patricia Lurch. I didn't look like Patricia Lurch. I wasn't even the same sex as Patricia Lurch. And I was younger than Patricia Lurch. But I went in there as Patricia Lurch, and they did and responded to Patricia Lurch's commands for them. Right? So this is no different. We have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Um, we're going to learn over time here that just because it's in us doesn't mean that we're in a position of authority to release it. We're going to learn. We're going to dive into authority. We're going to look at authority in great detail over the next few months. You have to understand authority. <coughs> um, but we need to start to release some patterns of ministry here so you can start to see, okay, I do want to minister to people. Your heart's called you to care. You clearly want to minister to people. You clearly want to know how to lead people to salvation. And you clearly want to lead people in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. These things are very, very important. So with that being said, if I prick you in the heart with something that I say that's offensive, instead of rejecting it out of hand, go to the Holy Spirit with it. Mm -hmm. you go, he's the teacher. Mm -hmm. He's the guide. And, and, and he's the arbiter of truth. He is the spirit of truth, and if, if you lift it up to him, he will show you where either I'm a bozo and wrong, or he will offer you the correction in your heart that you need. And you're going to find when you get into the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of the broken heart, that's precisely the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and he wants to remove 
the obstacles for continual manifestation. And usually these things are situated in pride because I've touched something that you're prideful of and, and there's a wounding there and in, instead of just giving it to Jesus, you're, you're, the temptation is to say, he's attacking me. And I'm not attacking you, I promise you, I'm not attacking you. I'm, I'm a preacher, so it sounds like I might be attacking you. Because <laughs> I, 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 do, I do talk with great passion, I minister with great passion. Yes. Time is quite short. Mm. I have a country that I'm deeply passionate about, mm. I love my country, and it's, it's falling off a cliff right now because nobody in the body of Christ understands <laughs> ministry and a great deal of people in the body of Christ aren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you're going to find that the sinner's prayer has nothing to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The very ingredient and the only ingredient that can actually change an individual into the image of God. You have the Spirit of God within you, but in order for your soul to be transformed, that requires the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. There's no other way for it to happen. Yeah. Jesus hasn't revealed another path for it to happen. Jesus' teaching ministry comes through the Holy Spirit. Jesus in Acts 2, Acts 1, commands his disciples to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're not even allowed to go into ministry. And the sinner's prayer has nothing to do with the fundamental ingredient that we need. It started about 70 years ago, which was about 30 years after one of the greatest revivals erupted, Azusa Street down in, in, in L.A. And we had a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In about 1940, 40-something or other, along comes an evangelist who has aspirations of having a very large audience in front of him, and how do I get those people saved? Well, if I bring them down to an altar call and I get them to say a prayer, done. The birth of the sinner's prayer happened in Billy Graham's ministry. It was picked up by Bill Albright, Campus Crusade for Christ. Bill Albright was, was a great admirer of Billy Graham. They were both looking at I set them up with a presentation, then I close them in my presentation. Anybody who has any kind of a sales model has a presentation they teach their salesmen, which is supposedly the gospel in this case, and then, they, and then, they, they, then, then Bill Albright said, I need to close, because I've got 15 people in front of me. How do I know that they're safe? Well, we're going to have a sinner's prayer. And so, these, so, so he looked at Billy Graham's model, accepted Billy Graham's model, and the only problem is it doesn't even deal with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And now you look at us 70 years later, and we have a body of Christ that is, in, that is as messed up as it's ever been in the history of this country. It's never been this bad. And, and, and until we understand there's a fundamental pattern of ministry that can introduce the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is what God seeks and desires, and we start to perform that ministry... We're not going to see the success that we're looking for both in ministry and we're not going to see this, the turnaround in our country that we need. And right now, the pattern of ministry that Jesus and John the Baptist practiced, I do not know why it's a lost art, if you want to call it that. It's just lost on the body of Christ. We're in a, part, we're in a time of apostasy. There's a dearth of revelation. Okay, There's been a revelation of the grace message that started unfolding in about the 1850s in around the 1550s. So the grace revelation has been going on for, what's that work out to be? 570 years, if my math is right? Well, the Holy Spirit's poured out in abundance in 1906. So the, so the revelation of the Holy Spirit, we've, we're relatively new in the infancy of this thing. And to think that we've mined or exhausted all the revelation of the Holy Spirit, that's nonsensical. We need to press into the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to understand the power of this ministry because the power of this ministry will transform this nation because yes. it did yes. it created this nation. Yes. It created this nation in the first place. And the third great awakening has already started, so this is going to happen anyway. You might as well position yourself at the front of the class so that God can use you to be instrumental in the change. Yeah. I mean, who wants to be second when you can be first? Amen. Consider this. Billy Graham died February 21st, 2018. And that mantle has not been picked up. God has promoted nobody to that position in this country. You need to ask yourself why. 
Because if it was the old established guard that's already up there, somebody would have risen to take that mantle. And they've not been promoted because their gospel isn't the new gospel that God's releasing. No one knew about the gospel, but he's hearkening back to the patterns that created everything. And, and someone's going to take that mantle, but it's not going to look the way that you think. So let's just jump into Romans. Um, where did I want to go? Romans 10, because that's pretty well where a lot of people know this from. Um, Okay, I, I'm going to read Ro, Romans 10, 3. I, I understand, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to make this statement. Romans 10 has nothing to do with evangelism. It is not written for the evangelist. It is not as an instruction manual to evangelism. It's not at all. He's talking about, he's talking about, he's talking about Jewish people in this instance, and he's talking about what these people look like who are saved. And he says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves. Notice the word submitted. Mm -hmm. They haven't submitted. Does the sinner's prayer make you submit to Jesus? Mm -hmm. Have you given up everything? Have you exhausted everything that you have? Do you understand that this is your identity that he's calling you from? Mm -hmm. That all of your hopes, all of your dreams, all of your expectations are in the toilet. They're done. The old man is over with. And now you serve Christ. And his interests fully submitted. Most people that are using the sinner's prayer aren't dealing with the ministry that Jesus dealt with to set people up to receive him. All right? But there's a notice they have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. What is the righteousness of God? It's Jesus. Yeah, of course it is. Why? Not because they felt they were righteous under the law, because they didn't want to submit to anybody. These are rebellious people. That's all that's going on here is rebellion. The people that you meet, they might be in rebellion. They're not going to want to submit. You're going to have to find out that there's a pattern of ministry that puts that spirit of rebellion down, puts water on it so it doesn't surface, and enables the love of Christ to pull them over into the light to change the way they think, that instantly Jesus can manifest his presence in them, and he can start attacking that rebellion with love on the inside that the individual actually feels and, and recognizes as the presence of God loving them. Not because I said they loved them, but because Jesus Christ loved them. Their own confession, right? So they didn't want to submit themselves to God. Um, let's jump down to verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart, notice this, the heart is going to be a, a central theme to all of this. With the heart man believes unto righteousness, or unto Jesus, or unto the in Christ reality, and with the mouth confession is made. But when we go back up here and say, if you shall confess, what does confess mean? It's a verb, it means to profess oneself the worshiper of one. This is someone who's devoted to worship. If I contrast this with Acts, I'm going to go over to Acts 2, and um, I'm going to go over to Acts 2 if I can find it. I, I, what, what I want you to see here is there's more to it than just this prayer. Um, and so Peter in Acts 2, he's given this very long sermon, okay? The Holy Spirit poured out, it's attracted a great crowd, and, and, and from virtually... Uh, 2.14, but Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. He's now recently baptized in the Holy Spirit, and this boldness comes over him, and he starts to speak. And you're going to notice that he talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then, verse 38, then Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. We're going to have to dive into repentance, and we'll get into that a little bit today. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for the promises unto you, to your children, uh, and all that the Lord shall call. Now, and with many other words, did he testify, exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, baptized where? In the name of Jesus Christ, and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that their day added 3,000. 
gladly receive. Gladly is an adverb. It means with joy and gladness. It means with delight. It's actually euphoric wishing. It's euphoric wishing, hoping for a change, looking for a delightful turn of events. You know, one of the problems with the sinner's prayer is, is that it, 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 you're going, a lot of people who use it are saying, if I can go minister and get them to say the prayer, then they're saved. That's witchcraft. That is witchcraft. You go in there with an agenda trying to corral them into saying something. That's witchcraft. They're a child of the Most High God. Their spirit, even if it's carnal, is going to bear witness that that's witchcraft. And they're going to go the other way from it. Or they're going to say the prayer just to get you off their back. And who doesn't want Jesus Christ as their Lord? Most of the people that have said the sinner's prayer have said it at least ten times. And they're still a train wreck. Why? Because it doesn't deal with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But, but did the minister who was dealing with the gospel and releasing the gospel bring someone into a position where there was euphoric wishing present? Did they really, really want to make a change? Were they really, really through with the old life? Did they really understand the consequences? And was the baptism of the Holy Spirit explain, explained so that they understood, you mean for the first time in my life I get to have power? I want to do good, but now I'm going to be able to do good? Yes, you'll have the power. Sign me up. Mm -hmm. Right? And then, yes, they'll make a recommitment to Christ. They've committed their lives to Christ ten other times, but you're going to make them make a recommitment to Christ because you might as well. And then they'll receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they will be converted. Yeah. And when the people get converted, that's when miracles happen. Amen. Because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the teacher, and it is the guide. I don't have a testimony off the top of my hand that I want to say. I've got a couple saved up in this teaching, so I think I'm just going to go on with that statement. <clears throat> the sinner's prayer. Also consider this. Billy Graham, as an evangelist, had a message that he was delivered by God before he called people up to do this pattern of prayer. What's your message? What's your message, and why are you doing it that way? Why? We have to give a defense of the gospel of Jesus. We have to give a defense of why are we doing things. It's not just good enough to do it because, well, he did it. Why are you doing it? And also, did, 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 the, did this ministry that's been released for the last 70 years, what's the fruit of this ministry? Well, our country's a train wreck. Christianity's sinking like a ship. And everywhere we go in ministry, we have virtually 100% conversion rate. And we're dealing not with the church so much. We're dealing with people that are outside the conventional church, people on the streets, in many cases, people that have been given up on. And society says, can't change. Yeah. So we got the hard luck, hard case, total conversion. We depend on the Holy Spirit to be the teacher and the guide and the changer. And even if the person, after they receive them and they get clean from heroin, they get clean from meth, they, four months later, decide to go back into that lifestyle we don't have this panic alarm, panic alert, because we understand the Holy Spirit is with them to convict them. And if they wallow in the mire for another two months or another three months, they will come back with a greater revelation that Jesus Christ is Lord, and they want less and less and less to be part of the old lifestyle. Amen. So each time the enemy brings a temptation, they may suffer that temptation, they may fall into temptation, but the distance between temptations, or the, the, the distance between <clears throat> falling into temptation and coming back into, in, into Christ or living as a Christian, shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter distances. And it's not because I'm in their bedroom, or it's not because I'm in their kitchen. It's not because I'm ministering to them once a week. It's because the Holy Spirit's talking to them all day long. Now, we do have the Jesus Challenge. We have some other ministry tools that we use that, that enable us to minister from distance. But at the same time, we witness over and over and over, most first converts don't dive in with both feet for more than a month or two. Right. And then they go back to their old pattern of behavior. Mm -hmm. But if they are legitimately baptized in the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. if they've tasted that fruit, that ministry will continue whether I'm there or not. John says, mm -hmm. you need but one teacher, and that's the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so what is the fruit of this? You know, I didn't hear Billy Graham say this. I, I, I've heard this spoken from the head of the class at Karis, but nobody in name specifically quoted, more like a title, like Billy Graham's right-hand man, so to say. 
that Billy Graham lamented towards the end of his ministry at, at the feeling that perhaps as few as 2% of the people that made that altar call were genuinely converted. This is God's man. There ain't no question it was God's man. He had an anointing on him. There was clearly an anointing. He was God's delegated authority in this country and around the globe for the gospel. He carried it to every government. He carried it to every government ambassador and minister. He was everywhere. Um, Yasser Arafat sat for Billy Graham, and Billy Graham preached the gospel to him. I mean, Billy Graham had an anointing to go open up doors. God opened up doors for him. But to, to be at the end of your ministry and to be concerned mm -hmm. that only 2% were converted, no thank you. Wayne Lurch don't want any part of that. Uh-uh. Right. I'd rather have 10 people converted than 100,000 people that didn't get converted. What? Mm -hmm. So why would I want to waste my time? I want to be, you know, understand we are stewards. Yes. We are stewards. And people want to bog down in the stewardship idea of i got to watch my money. I'm a steward of my money. I'm a steward of my time. I'm a steward of my treasure. The reality is those are small ball. You are stewards of a section of the kingdom of heaven mm -hmm. that is supposed to be translated on earth. You're given a geographical space or a quantity that he says, Wayne Lurch, you can do that. You can do that. You can fill this quota of the kingdom of heaven on earth. You can be responsible for translating this much darkness into light. And when I got started doing this about 10 years ago, I thought, wow, holy smokes, I'm behind the eight ball. i got to figure out an efficient way of doing this. Because if I started when I was 20, maybe I'd be retired by now. But since I got started when I was nearly 50, I didn't really, you know, maybe you want to be 120 years old, 120 years old like Moses. I don't really aspire to be quite that old. Um, so I looked at it logically. I have to be efficient. I have an efficiency here that is required of me. I need to understand why I'm doing something. And when I asked the church, why do you do it that way? Nobody had a really good explanation for me. Why? It's the way we do it. But, but, but why? Right? There's, a, there's, a, there's an instruction manual here. And so since they didn't have the answers, I had to go to the Lord and get my own answers. Mm -hmm. And then develop my own pattern of ministry, which is right out of the Bible. It worked. Yes. Well, okay. It's because it's the way Christ did it. It should work. So all I'm saying about the sinner's prayer is there's a better way. Yeah. I haven't even addressed because I'm running long on time here, but I'll say this much. There's a nonsensical piece of it. An individual is born a sinner. Right. Yes. They have no choice. They have no decision making in this. Right. They are who they are based on God's design. Right. If we didn't have to have the fall, there wouldn't have been a fall. Is God an order? Is God a, God a disorder? Did Satan totally throw him off his game? God, I never saw that coming. <laughs> no, of course he saw it coming. Adam had limited authority on earth because if he put all the authority there and Satan captures all the God's authority, then he's got a tiger by the tail. He baits Satan into that. Adam has to take the fall. He takes the one for the team, right? He's the first sacrifice. He takes one for the team. But the reality is my fall or my fallen nature is by design. It also protects my free will. I have to, God calls me and I say yes, right? God, I, God calls me, I say yes. Well, the sinner's prayer is saying, you need to confess every sin, what? That you did. This was you doing these things. No, it wasn't. It was the fallen nature that God put in me doing these things. I'm powerless over sin until I get the damn gift you're asking of me or offering me. You understand? Why am I dragging his nose in the mud? And can I find John the Baptist dragging his nose in the mud? Can I find Jesus dragging anybody's nose in the mud? And you cannot. At all. Now, is there a place for the confession of sin? Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. When you slip up and you make a mistake, you're supposed to be remorseful. It's called yes. humility. It's called, I, it's called, man, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to behave that way. In fact, you're supposed to have a conviction in you of the Holy Spirit that you're supposed to have a revelation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to act that way. Okay. And how, Holy Spirit, can you help me not act this way? I need you to come into my heart, you're going to find, and fix whatever's broken so that I don't continue to lash out in this behavior. I want to end this behavior once and for all. And the Holy Spirit says, gotcha, I'll, I'll, I'll work that out in you, you know what I'm saying? So, so there is a place for confession of sin, and there is a place uh, of ministry where you're, you're telling people to, hey, listen, forgive the individual who you hold offense. In the name of Jesus, I forgive somebody 
the, 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 the action of forgiveness is considered righteous. But the reality is, to make somebody confess that they're a sinner is insane. Of course they're a sinner. <laughs> Duh. What retard doesn't think they're a sinner? <laughs> that started back in Genesis. And so there's a perversion here. But if you look at the history and the roots of religion, think about religion, denominational religion, and think about how it commingles the law, and think how it brings the law and grace together. <laughs> think about how the spirit of religion is always trying to push on you a little bit. You need to do something. you got to act when the reality is it's a gift. It's the Holy Spirit coming in you. That you can go back and if you start to meditate and analyze, you can see that the that the root that this tree that this citrus pear grew from, it was a it was a bad tree to start with. It was the wrong tree. It wasn't love. It wasn't the tree of life. It was the tree of good and evil. Amen. It, it was born off the wrong tree to begin with. But that's way too much on the sinner's prayer. Um, I will continue to bring revelation to the sinner's prayer um, because what we want to be is highly effective. Because yes. if you are effective in ministry, I assure you, God will strategically use you. He's already ordained pieces, and these pieces are people. And he absolutely knows who's ready to say yes. And if he has a talented, talented minister who understands the ministry that, that he wants, who can step into that void, he will place you there, and the reward that you get will blow your mind. Mm -hmm. It will explode your heart with such satisfaction and such love. And you're going to find that each and every one of you is capable to do it, right? It's, uh, you really are. This, is, this doesn't require any kind of extraordinary talent. So that is enough on the sinner's prayer. Uh, the ministry of the forerunner, John the Baptist. Consider this. First of all, John the Baptist was baptized in the Holy Spirit in the womb. Yes. Okay? Boom. In the womb, this cat gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. Was that necessary to his ministry? Clearly, was that necessary to his maturing as a minister before God released him? Clearly, otherwise he doesn't get baptized in the Holy Spirit in the womb. The, the, if that wasn't necessary, you know, pe people say the Bible's got a, it's a huge book, it's got a lot of words. It, if, if the Holy Spirit was going to try to communicate everything that he did, the book would be so big. We don't read it as it is. That book would never, ever, ever get read. But, but the... So if you look at what's in here, it's the bare minimum that's included. It is enough to get the job done. You don't need any more than that. But he's choosing his words carefully. And when he introduces John the Baptist as being baptized in the Holy Spirit in the womb, that's a big deal. When you look at everything that's written about John the Baptist, that's a big deal. Yes. That comes right when you hear about it. He's baptized from the Holy Spirit in his womb. Hallelujah. Emphasizing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But understand... That this ministry of the forerunner, if it wasn't necessary, if, if the pattern of ministry that John the Baptist brought to the earth wasn't necessary, Jesus wouldn't have had it done. And Jesus knew that he needed, for whatever reason, okay, he's a God of order, so he is setting the table for himself. And he chooses to set the table this way, that this pattern of ministry is going to be released by a man or a woman. And it is a prerequisite or a requirement for me to manifest. Now, can he manifest unilaterally without it? Of course he can. He's God. But he's creating a pattern of ministry because he is, wants to engage his children. We're now the ministers. He wants us to go out and pull the harvest in. He wants us to have compassion for every living human being as if it was our own mother or our own brother or our own sister. And not the brother, mother, or sister that beat you and whipped you and, and did abuse you. The other mother, brother, and sister that treated you lovely and gave you a great inheritance and always deferred to you and always lifted you up and honored you and always protected you and always defended you, right? That brother or sister or mother or father, he wants you to look at that because that's how he sees that. And he wants you to be equipped in such a way so that you can engage these people because there's a great deal of them that are coming in. And this is probably the end time harvest. Everybody seems to think so. It's the third great awakening. I assure you it's already started. So the ministry of John the Baptist, the ministry of the forerunner, it's essential. And so if it is essential, we need to know what the heck it is. Yes. We got to know what it is. And it is different than the ministry of Christ, although there are a lot of similarities. You're going to find there's a lot of similarities. And you're also going to find that John the Baptist's ministry it lasted for exactly six months or thereabouts as we can determine in the Bible, and that as soon as that as soon as that he was imprisoned, 
Jesus picked up his mantle, and so that ministry of John the Baptist, the ministry of the forerunner, was merged into Christ's ministry. He was now performing both ministries, which is what exactly you're going to be doing, performing both ministries. So if we, if we isolate John the Baptist and we see what this looks like, and then we take a look at Jesus, you're going to see similarities, but what you're going to see is, wow, there's a pattern of behavior here of how I engage people, and they're going to come, you're, Jesus is going to manifest, and then they're going to say all the things that I want to hear. Okay, yeah. so, John the Baptist. Um, okay, we're going to start in Malachi 3. Well, we're going to start in the Old Testament. Okay, 32 minutes we're going. Okay, a little behind schedule. Mm -hmm. i put the afterburners on. Um, we, may, we may skip one scripture to make, make time. Because this is all stuff, I, I assure you, this is all stuff that, that we will continue to cover. Mm -hmm. I'm just introducing it because I want you to be aware of it. I want you to be aware of it and, and some of it's, you know, it's a, it's a little challenge to the, to the theology and so as soon as we start to get some of these sacred cows with an arrow on the side of them, the better. Um, Malachi 3.1 This is a prophetic word about John the Baptist. Behold, I will send my messenger. Notice this. God is saying, I'm going to send the guy. He's going to send you. He's going to send you. If you want to be this person, you can be this person. Pick me. Right? Pick me, pick me, pick me. If you say, pick me, pick me, pick me, often enough, he's going to say, why? Well, because I really want to do it. Why? He'll ask you why. And he'll mine something out of your heart that'll, that'll vest you in. I want to do it because it's, my heart is broken for these people. And boom, he'll start to line up people for you one after another. But, behold, I will send my messenger. We've been, we got sent to the, to the uh, Navajo Nation. This is our third trip and our third sending. We didn't say, hey, well, I think it would be a great idea to go to the Navajo Nation. What do you think? Yeah, let's go tomorrow. No, God said. Okay. Well, God said, then we got, some, we got something that's going to be good. So, I will send my messenger. This word messenger, uh, is, it's his representative, it's his deputy, but it also has a notion of a prophet. Um, and this gifting and, and, and this ministry comes with it, the spirit and power of Elijah. Why not? It'd be you. It cut, but if you don't understand that it's coming with spirit and power, you may not have the expectation of it. You've got to place a demand on this. Hey, wait a minute. This is what it's coming with? I want that ministry. That sounds really cool. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall. So there's a certain guarantee to you that you're going to be able to prepare the way before me. So he shall prepare the way before me. Prepare, the verb pana means to make clear or free from obstacles. Now, it's always about the heart. God gives you a brand new heart. We could go through and, and develop scriptures about the heart, and, and I could bring a, a, a lot of scriptures to here. But So he's going to remove the obstacle out of the heart. The out of that, and it also means to turn towards something or to turn away from something. So what is positioning, what, what, what it's saying is he's going to prepare, and this word prepare is he's going to be speaking and engaging an individual and disarming an individual and drawing an individual into him in relationship that, that starts to remove the obstacle in the heart. And you're going to find that when this obstacle is removed, Jesus has the authority to instantly manifest and to instantly manifest is to completely fill him. Mm -hmm. And you're going to find that, that it, it has a specific connotation to soul and body. John the Baptist came so that Jesus could impress upon your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's really cool. And to make it, use your body as an instrument to prove it. Ankle healed. Sunday. Even though she's like, I don't know, I'm a nurse, I don't know if I can receive healing. God said, but you can. It's not, God said, it's not contingent on your faith. That's right. The pastor's got enough faith for all of y'all, so don't worry about it. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way. He's going to prepare the way. He's going to remove the obstacles. Uh, and, and what's going to end up happening is, repentance is this action of turning. It's not that okay, I've, I've, I'm at 12 o'clock and I've, and I've gone all the way to, to 11.45. I haven't pivoted and gone 90 degrees the other way. The moment that you move and you start to come into greater agreement to who God says he is, 
who God says you are, what he says about your circumstances, that is a shadow. Every time the sundial moves a fraction, there's a shadow that moves with it. That detected shadow, however minute it is, that is repentance. And understand, Jesus isn't looking for you to give your whole thing. He's looking for a craft in ministry. He just wants to prove he's God. Because why? He loves you. And he loves the people that are in front of you. He wants you to be exalted as a minister, and he adores the person that's in front of you. So all he needs this person to do is come to a slight change of opinion. And so now this is going to change the way you talk to people. I'm not trying to get him over here to say a prayer. What do I give a rep? I just need you to change the way you think. And when you start to change the way you think, you're going to tell me. And I know, based on this verse, yo, it's time for you to show up. And you're going to place a demand on Christ's ministry, and he's going to say, that's right. You watch me work now. And you watch him reward you because you've opened the door for him to work. Amen. And understand, as much as people like to think of God as a seed, he's not a seed. He never said he was a seed. This is another cow before you get all mad at me. He never said he's a seed in Scripture. He likens himself to a seed, to an agricultural generation. But he doesn't. But, but that, if you think he is a seed, and you think the word is a seed, the word is God. It's not a seed. He is God. The word in the beginning was the word. The word was. The word is. Right? God, God, God. Um, the word of God is God. Uh, you're sowing God. You're sowing God. And if the individual isn't rejecting God, God's in there. You're going to find that you have a partner in there working right away. And if you think that you're sowing a seed that it's going to take 10 days before God does something, your expectation of that ministry is going to be one of discouragement because Satan's going to oppose you. And you're not going to be able to withstand the opposition. Just like the, just like the apostles freaked out when, they left, when the kid with seizures flopped out in front of them. They weren't able to stand. They didn't understand. They just didn't understand yet. They also didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? So they didn't have some of the gifting that we have. But understand, behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way. Way here, Derek is a noun. It's used quite a bit. It means moral character, man or habit, way. It's a direction or a path. So he's going to prepare the way for a change in moral behavior. He's going to prepare the way. I'm going to manifest, and this guy's behavior is going to change. The thinking is going to change, and it's going to mean the action is going to change, and the action is going to be slightly more skewed towards God. That is a change in moral behavior. It doesn't mean you absolutely have to stop sinning today. Okay, let me let me give this brief testimony. We're down in we're down in, in, in to, in to illustrate this. To illustrate this, <coughs> we're down in Pueblo. It's around Christmas time, and I'm not going to use this gal's name. We'll call her Brittany. Um, they've asked us into their house. Uh, we were offering toys, boxed up, nice toys, wrapped up, in exchange for uh, ministry. We'll give you toys, but you got to you got to submit to the gospel. It's like a bait and switch. And uh, and it was the first time we tried. It. We didn't know if it would work or not. It was an absolute smashing hit. We wind ourselves, and we're in a house with two women. Uh, I, I stand up and I preach the gospel because that's what I do. And I preach the gospel about 15, 20 minutes. I sit down with the one girl, and she goes, "You understand I'm a lesbian." Then I'm like, "Well, I probably could have figured that out because there's two women in the same house, but I haven't really <laughs> drawn that conclusion yet." But I didn't even, I didn't even say, I just shrugged my shoulders and I said, are you in love? Yeah. Oh, it's nice to be loved. Done. I'm not, I don't care about her lesbian behavior. That's up to the Holy Spirit to convict her. This is an identity crisis in the heart. This is an identity crisis in the soul. This isn't a, it is a spiritual crisis, okay? But reality is she's not capable of discerning spirit because she's carnal. She's not born again. She's not, she's not baptized in the Holy Spirit. She doesn't have a teacher. So I just let the, the homosexuality thing go right out the door. Then I let the meth pipe go out the door, and then I let the heroin go out the door, and I let the pot go out the door until so we can get into the real issue. Who raped you? Who raped you? Were you ever sexually molested? Yes. You're going to find that ministry, preparing of the heart, is going to, you're going to have to ask questions. And they're going to be difficult questions. But if someone's in a homosexual relationship, the chances are very good that they received a very significant sexual trauma, if not one more than one. All right? And this is a heart wound you're going to find in a few minutes. And this is what Jesus came to heal. And so all she needs is Jesus. She don't need me telling her that her behavior is wrong. She needs Jesus to be able to change the behavior. He'll change the nature of the individual, and the nature will, by, by nature, if she's baptized in the Holy Spirit, will conform. In this, in, in this household, it was the night of the, um, 
Bethlehem Star. Really cool night. These women had physical ailments, and both of them got miraculously physically healed. That blew their minds because this opened their, their minds to God. So there is this idea of miracles and signs and wonders that you're in charge with performing and ministry. But you're using them to validate the resurrection. Right. You're saying, Jesus Christ really was this guy, and I can prove it. Watch your thumb. Hallelujah, your thumb. Oh, my God, my thumb just got healed. And they're like, that is the most crazy thing. And it's like, it is crazy, isn't it? But remember what I said. Jesus Christ is Lord. And they start to consider Jesus Christ is Lord. And then what happens? And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Now, that's how you know it's Jesus. And, and, and whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord. This word suddenly... means suddenly surprising it, it means with it's the notion of, of coming into something the root verb means instantly so it's coming into something and it comes from the un, un, unused root meaning to open the, the eyes of so all of a sudden jesus comes in and opens their spiritual eyes and they can see god they can see light instead of darkness and then all of a sudden they're like tell me more well if you have fear and anxiety do you have some of these things going on because if you're using meth and heroin you probably have depression fear yeah okay in the name of jesus these spirits will cast those out of you Whoa, now the spirits are out of them. Do you think that they're the same people? No, they're told. Now you're dealing with someone that's radically different. You got God revealing God to them on the fly, healing happening, and you have the demons that were tormenting them, uh, most of them out of them, or tamped down at bay. Now you have an individual who can actually rationally experience God. Do you want power over this? Do you want power? Do you want the power over this? Do you want power over it? Yes, I want the power over temptation. They both get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that was probably, so that's Christmas, so what do we are now? Eight, nine, nine months, eight and a half months, nine months later. The gal who one of the gals in that relationship, super, super sweet, um, sent a message out just about a month ago saying, I don't think I want to be in a relationship with a woman anymore. Amen. Mm -hmm. I have a desire to be with a man. We had never brought up homosexuality yet. Oh, that's awesome. You let the Holy Spirit do the hard lifting. Amen. I'm not saying there isn't a place for, for debating the Holy Spirit, debating homosexuality, but that's like the last place, you know. So, so there's a there's a pattern of preparing the heart. We're not going to really get into that today, but we see it work over and over and over and over, and it's breaking down the barriers without standing up and saying, "I'm going to preach the whole gospel of God." Homosexuality is a sin. We deal with a, with, with a population oftentimes that's filled with homosexuality. The, 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 the culture of meth and heroin lends itself to that. It's, it's just how you slide into that behavior. And so we had a halfway home, halfway home ministry, and it was all women, and it was a beautiful ministry. And we had about seven or eight gals. They were all homosexuals. They all got baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were all starting to live for Christ. And we brought him to this new church startup that we had going. I wasn't the pastor. I was just helping the guy get it started. And he just diverts off the path, and he starts preaching against homosexuality, real proud that I'm a pastor. I preach the whole counsel of God. And these women were crushed. And they were right back in the jackpot where they're like, God doesn't love me. I'm like, don't listen to that guy. He's crazy. He's a bad guy. We're not going right <laughs> so, wait, so, wait, is part of preparing the way... Um, when you, whether it's like um, praying for relatives or whatever, to ask God to turn their heart of stone into a heart of flesh that they can receive? No, this is, this is, um, th th pr praying for people is one thing. No, this is actively ongoing ministry with people where you're talking to people and you're, and you're sharing with them the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. We didn't get into that. I'll say it very briefly. John the Baptist had a message that was super encouragement, didn't talk about sin, other than the fact that you could have free freedom from it. These were, he was talking to a culture that couldn't be freed from sin, saying, oh no, there, there is a whole new thing that has happened here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Sounds like, well, I don't know what that really means, but the, but the word basilia, or however you want to pronounce that, means the right to rule and reign in authority with the Messiah on his kingdom on earth. And it's not, an, it's not like a... A kingdom like the state of Colorado, it's a spiritual kingdom, but but it, but it, it, it's specifically referencing the, the the right to rule and reign with the Messiah, same authority, same power, partnership. No one ever heard of this before. 
and the kingdom of heaven is at hand, hand in Gizo, it means you're to join these to you. You're, you're to join to this opportunity to, to be with the Messiah, to be completely freed from your sins. And then, and then we're not, we'll, we'll, we'll teach on water baptism at some point here. Um, not tonight though, but water baptism, and we can prove this through scripture, is specifically designed to create an experience in the body and the soul so that Jesus can instantly manifest. It's not. It's not. A, it's not a sign of a, of a of a of an of an outward change. It actually is an inward change that occurs at the moment of baptism, and it produces by design. It is designed by God so that He can manifest His presence. If people aren't taught that before they get into the baptism tank, their experience might be less than because their expectation is less than. And there's a law of expectation here, right? There's a law of expectation at play. So John the Baptist, Malachi three one. Let's just go to Luke one. We're going to skip Isaiah. And um, and then we'll we'll conclude our discussion on the on the Baptist or on the the ministry of the forerunner Luke Matthew Mark Luke comes in okay Luke uh, uh, sixteen no oh, no verse fifteen and he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb so we talked about that and many of the children of Israel shall he turn. Many of the many of the children of Israel shall he turn. Epistrepho is a verb, means to turn back or to turn towards. Um, it's referencing worship. They will turn back to worship. The enemy has stolen worship. We're to restore worship. That's what everybody's fighting. For. Who's going to get worship? Satan or God? Turning, he shall turn. He shall turn to he shall many of the children of the Israel shall he turn to the Lord. Um, it, 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 it's it's to turn, it's transition. It means to convert by changing or switching direction. Uh, taking the opposite of of a, of a, of a, or a divergent course. So you're ministering to the individual, and the individual says, Wow, I am worthy. I am worthy. You're telling me I'm worthy. You're telling me I'm welcome. You're telling me I'm necessary. You're showing me a scripture where I'm welcome. You're showing me a scripture where I'm worthy. And now you're showing where God says I'm absolutely necessary. You're changing the way that you think. You're turning towards God. This is worship. This is praise. Right? This is servanthood. Okay? So this is what he's going to do. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Hallelujah. This isn't just restricted to John the Baptist. Now, Elijah's mantle fell and Elijah got the mantle. If you want to look at it going in the power of Christ, that's fine. But 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 Elijah was considered the greatest Old Testament prophet. And then he called fire down on Mark Carmel. Mm -hmm. The dude was cool. He went up in a chariot of fire. He's a great guy. He, he made some mistakes, but yeah, call on that. You want that gift? Call on that gift. That's for you today. That's an hour. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers. Notice we're talking about heart again. Back in, in, in Romans, if you confess with your heart, believe with your heart. Confess with your mouth, believe with your heart. Turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and just put hearts there because it's the, that's what the context is. And the heart of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So the people are being disobedient, right? They're not behaving God. They're not listening to God. They're deceived. I can show you in Scripture where God isn't penalizing them. And God isn't saying, you're the idiot for not following me. He's blaming the shepherd. For them, he has mercy. But nonetheless, they're still being disobedient, whether they recognize it or not. To, to turn the hearts of those being disobedient to the wisdom or the right way of thinking and the right way of behaving and the right moral conduct of Jesus. That's what this ministry is designed to do. To make a people re to, to make ready a people prepared for the to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So here's this ready and prepare again, or, or, or preparing a way. Ready, my verb to make ready, to make the necessary preparations in the mind and the heart of men to give the Messiah a fit reception. Now we also saw back in Malachi that if you do this, God instantly manifests. So it's not like you're doing this and wondering, well, well, will Jesus do something? No, Jesus said, I'm going to instantly manifest. You take him at his word. He'll instantly manifest. You hold him accountable for his manifestation. Right? You hold him accountable for his job. We just do our job to prepare to the, and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. 
the, 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 uh, the root adjective ready means ready because the necessary preparations have been made to receive the one coming. Prepared is another verb. It means to prepare exactly or to make exactly ready using skillful implements according to a tool design. And the compound root, the base root of it means a revelation in the heart and the revelation in the soul and the revelation in the body. So the, the ministry of John the Baptist is designed to, to minister to the heart of the individual, to get them to start to think a little differently about who God says he is, who God says they are, what he says about their circumstances, so Jesus can instantly manifest. This will, in turn, cause a measure of obedience. Now, is it five degrees, one degree, or 50 degrees? I don't know, and I don't care. It's a shadow of turning. This is repentance. And every time they start to change the way they think, God can instantly manifest and show himself to be Lord again. And you can have this person and all of a sudden in this relationship with God where they keep changing the way they think and he keeps manifesting and every single day they're like, oh my God, I, this is amazing. I had no idea that God would be with me all day long, every day. He would talk to me, he would protect me. And they're floored. They're, they're, they're absolutely floored when, 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 when they see the, the grace of God take over where they've been kicked in the teeth all their lives. So uh, we've got eight minutes left and we have really... Let's go to Luke 4.18, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll just die. We'll, we'll just end it right there. Um, Jesus introduces his ministry in Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Okay, this is, this is a declaration. I have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For this cause he has anointed me. So for this cause he's got a peculiar anointing. To preach the gospel to the poor. Poor is simply someone who's unable to do it for themselves. That's every man, woman, and child on the earth. We're all considered the poor. To preach the gospel to the poor now. <laughs> there, there are some places in here. He didn't come to preach to the righteous. He came to preach to the people that were that knew they were unrighteous. So the people that are like, I don't need Jesus. I don't care about Jesus. And you know, a religious pharisaical type, he didn't go to preach to them. He came to preach to the people. So there's wisdom in, in, in where you preach the gospel and how you preach the gospel. But for the most part, it's everybody God puts in front of you. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering sight to the blind, and set liberty to them that are bruised. Notice the very first thing that he's, he's been sent to do, and that's to heal the brokenhearted. And that's kind of maybe the point that I want to make. Um, and if we flip over to this other handout, maybe we'll just, we'll just close it up here and we'll just keep it right at an hour. And maybe we'll pick up next week a little bit from where we left off. So, no, he came to heal the brokenhearted. Heal is a verb, and it means to, to make whole or free from errors. Now, this is a big deal. Whole, by definition, is an unbroken or an undamaged state. Error, by definition, is the state or condition of being wrong in conduct or judgment, discernment, wisdom, or good sense. So, understand that when you're ministering to somebody, they're making a bad decision. These errors in judgment, these errors in these lies that are in their heart, and the best way that I can describe it is, think about it as a mathematical problem. Think about, think about an equation where at the thousands, 0 .001, there's, a, there's, um, there's an error. Shows up, and you don't have any idea. You're inputting data into this, into this program, but you're putting it at the tenths, and everything's working good. You have decisions where we're at the hundreds and you're, you're doing everything's great. And then boom, you have a decision that involves a thousands category, air shows up, and you make a decision based on your judgment. Mm -hmm. You think you're doing the right thing and it's the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. You understand, it's the blind spot. The healing of the broken heart is finding out where these errors are. And these people are as confused as you are about these errors. And they're as discouraged as anybody could ever be. When you deal with someone who's homeless, the reality is there's a gazillion errors, and there, a lot of them are showing up in the 10th category. But it's not because they want to be homeless. It's not because they want to kick themselves in the face. It's because everything they've ever tried doesn't work. And if you go back into their life, you're going to find they were raped, they were molested, they were beat, they were abused, they were starved. That You're going to find trauma after trauma after trauma after trauma after trauma in many, 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 many instances. And you're there to remove the trauma. You're there to ask the question um, that removes this air in judgment so that when they're making rational decisions and they're talking to God, that this, this air doesn't pop up 
and cause them to have a lack of judgment or a lack of discernment. This is how you have compassion for people. You understand that the broken heart is causing them to make a wrong judgment. This is being done from a point of conscience. They actually believe what they're doing is right. And if you don't have compassion on that and understanding and mercy for that like Jesus did, you're going to come across as self-righteous and they're going to see right through it and they're going to push you away and go, you're just like every other member of the church. I'll, I'll close with a testimony here about this broken heart we, we, and homeless. And we ran across the guy, this was May 15th of, uh, hmm, it wasn't last year, it was probably a year ago, May 15th. We were down at, we were down at uh, Dorchester Park which is cl uh, very close to the Springs Rescue Mission down in the Springs. We were sent there by God. At the end of a long day of ministry, we saw a lot of miracles. We saw a lot of move of God. And uh, there's a, guy, a homeless guy in a pickup truck. And one of the prophets on the team said, you've got to minister to that guy. And it was like, oh, man, please, it's like 5 o'clock. We're done. But when the prophet points the way, you've got to go the way. So we go over, we talk to the guy, and the guy's like, Hey, you know, he's friendly enough and all of that. And, and I say, so, so tell me, when's the first time you heard of Jesus? And, and he says, well, you know, I heard of Jesus when I was, was a little kid and, and so forth and so on. I said, when's the first time you gave your life to Jesus? And he said, well, I gave my life to Jesus when I was 21 years old at a bus terminal. And he tells about this miraculous encounter with Jesus. And I'm like, dude, saved. Saved is saved. Stuck in a truck? Saved. Stuck in a truck saved. And I'm like, man, there's something wrong here. And I was like, well, okay, so let's just talk a little bit more about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He was a little bit uncertain about that. Thought he was baptizing the, Holy, baptizing the Holy Spirit, wasn't really sure, wasn't speaking in tongues. Therefore, not baptizing the Holy Spirit as far as I was concerned. So, okay, let me ask you something. Do you struggle to forgive anybody in your life? Well, here what comes out of this story. You've got to pull it out a little bit. His mother and father were executed at a gas dump down on the border in Texas. His dad was a drug lord. And it was a cartel dispute, and they executed his father and his mother, and he was in the car and he witnessed it. Then one year to the date later, at the exact same gas pump, his two brothers were execute, executed by the same cartel. He's 16 at the time, 15 and 16. Now he's 30, homeless, up here in Colorado Springs. And so I'm like, wow, that's really heavy. Duh, I can get why you're like really stuck right now. And I said, have you ever been able to f f uh, forgive your father for the execution of your mother and your brothers. And he had never thought that his father was culpable. He was mad at the two other guys that shot him. I said, they're not the bad guys here. Your old man's the bad guy. And he's like, oh. I said, you've got to forgive your father for the execution of your mother, and you've got to forgive your father for all this train wreck of your life. He's the one that brought you into this lifestyle. And this is not an easy thing. You're going to find some people just aren't going to be capable of forgiving. They're going to really struggle, but you're going to know that this is the demonic stronghold. Mm -hmm. And when this finally broke, um, and the, the, the flow of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that came through this guy, his name is Ezra, overwhelmed the entire ministry team there. We all couldn't stop speaking in tongues. It, it just filled the whole parking lot with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And we were there, and we were so floored. And now you're like totally awake, everything's going, you can probably minister for the next five hours. <laughs> Um, but it's because you're taking time with a guy and you understand his heart's broken. You understand he doesn't want to be homeless. He's homeless for a reason. And we just need to go back in his past and find out what's wrong. And, 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 and you're to love your neighbor. You're to honor your mother and father. You're to love your mother and father. He's breaking major commandments of God. Therefore, there's no way for him to operate in the identity of Christ. He's operating in Adam. Adam ain't got no power. He ain't got no authority. He's getting abused by the devil. And he doesn't understand why. He's a smart guy. He's, in fact, he's an extremely prophetic guy. And if you fast forward about, I don't know, maybe five months, I suppose, Jerry did a lot of heavy lifting on that ministry. And a, and a gal from uh, Fair Play, um, Tracy Edstrom, those two people were point to, to minister to him. He did the Jesus Challenge down there. Uh, when he left Colorado Springs, and he had his, car repos his truck repossessed. They gave him his truck back with $8,000. Oh, wow. Got his truck back plus cash. And he got a $60,000 job in the oil refinery down in Texas, where he's from. And Ezra is, is, is a rock star. And he's a rock star. And it's because, it's, it's, it's just simply because we didn't see a homeless guy. We saw a child of God and didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Clearly there was something wrong with him. We understood that Jesus could instantly manifest. We just needed to start to get repentance in here. We dealt with a real major hairy issue. 
That enabled the Holy Spirit to take over. And then after that, there was still ministry that Jerry did one-on-one. -on -one. Because once you start to, you know, bring this dirty laundry of murder out and execution and that, you got to talk about that maybe more than one time. Yeah. And you got to, it, it, but the reality was it was the Holy Spirit that did all the heavy lifting there that day. Mm -hmm. And it was the Holy Spirit that, that continues to minister. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the name of Jesus, we'll just stop right there at 101. And hopefully we got enough out there to give you guys something to chew on, but not too much out there. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you can see these ministries do exist. And, and, and we'll continue to develop them, but this is the pattern of ministry that produces miracle after miracle after miracle. I was going to, I'll give you this brief testimony. I was going to include it, but I didn't have time. The, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a gal down in uh, Pueblo whose name is Ashley, and uh, Antonio and Felicia are back there, uh, both from Pueblo. And this was a friend of Antonio's who had been, uh, she's a gal in her 30s, and she had struggled mightily with addiction of, of uh, meth primarily, but heroin as well. And she was homeless. She had a daughter who was at the time about 15, and she had another daughter who was probably 10 at the time. Uh, both those children were living with other people, and both those children didn't like their mommy very well because their mommy had been homeless, running the streets, using drugs for a number of years. And she decided that she wanted to make a change. She'd had enough. She was tired of it. She'd seen Antonio make the change. And uh, so she, she, she had, in, in her own words, she'd rededicated her life to Christ. We, I was hunting her down because I knew she wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I knew that this, this change of attitude would be temporary, that temptation would come and overrun her. And she knew that I was hunting her down, so she was avoiding me. So she sort of made a commitment to Christ, but she kind of knew that if she came to me that she'd be stuck in that commitment to Christ. So she still hadn't quite, she sort of had one foot in, one foot out. But uh, on this particular day, I came down, she, she agreed to meet with us. She had agreed to meet with us before, but then, then, then ditched us. And uh, I was waiting in Antonio's apartment at the time. We waited for four hours. And in fact, I was going to bail on this. And Antonio was like, give it time, give it time, give it time. I was like, man, I'm out of here. Let's go get something to eat. I'm hungry. He was like, no, no, she's coming. I swear she's coming. And at 4 o'clock, she comes. Now, at 4 o'clock, she walks through the door. What had happened that day? She had taken a pregnancy test, and she had found out that she had twins. She's pregnant with twins. She's in a, she's in a relationship with a guy. It's, this is not a marriage. This is a street relationship. This is unholy. This is fornication. This is every other word you can imagine. And uh, But she's going to be a mother again. And she comes in, and she gets ministered to for a period of time, and it's like, you want the power? And she goes, man, i got to have the power. And she gets ridiculously filled with the Holy Spirit. I said, breathe in the Holy Spirit. And it's like a cartoon. It's like he shoved the Holy Spirit in her and her stomach went boom. And she went out with this fountain. And I was like, wow, I don't think I've ever have seen that. I said, girl, you're like in the top ten of baptisms of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's that was... What, so, so December 19, 2019. Yeah, okay, December 19, 2019. So the children now are, what, eight months old? Yeah. Nine months old? No, they, they're, they're, they're over a year. A little over a year. A little over a year. Yeah. So she gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. Of course, she wants her two daughters back. Of course, her two daughters don't want anything to do with her. Right? You understand that? And her mother's a little bit tweaked at her, right? So nobody believes that she's born again. Nobody believes she's baptized in the Holy Spirit. She does the Jesus Challenge. We're faithful to minister to her. Uh, the babies are born. We bless the babies. And, and, and we cast the demons out of those babies and all this other stuff. Then... Um, Antonio and Felicia uh, kept ministering to the the, the eleven year old uh, who's not was ten now eleven. We're in the house. She watches us minister to her mother. We kind of get her. We, finally, we co coerce her into ministry. We get her delivered from this demon that was just jacking her. And uh, the next visit, she gets she gives her life to Christ. She gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. She calls her sis, seventeen year old sister who's on the streets and says, "You got to have what I have." This Jesus is real. This Jesus is real. And so Antonio, we, we were down ministering in, in, on Antonio's block. And uh, I just told Antonio, I said, text the girl and her boyfriend and just see if they'll come over. If they do come over, they're, they're signing up for the hot seat. They know this is the barbecue station. <laughs> they know they're going to get barbecued. So if they come, this is good. If they don't, you know, they, 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 when they walk through the door, they've made their mind up in a way. And so they come in, we preach the gospel to them, we make them sign the Jesus Challenge, 
and say, you're transferring the authority of your life to this guy. You're no longer yourself. And they're like, whoa. I said, no, this is for real, dude. This is real. You're signing right here. When you put your name there and I witnessed it, it's a done deal and you can't go back on this. And they're like, oh, okay. We, we, they huddled up and they're like, he's like, no, I think we still we should do it. I'm still thinking we should do it. I think we should do it. And so they're fully advised of their rights. They know the gospel and they make a decision. When they both get baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's really beautiful. But the first thing she does was call her mother. And she calls her mother and says, Mama, I speak just like you. <laughs> now, if you fast forward a few months, they're all in the same house together. Amen. We have a Bible study in that house. And you have, you have a family that's been reunited. But it started with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that delivered it from meth. It delivered it from heroin. And, and that's what we see over and over and over. We see, we see that it just pulls families together. So the main problem we have in this country is the division of family. This is how you unite family. It's the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that ministry quite a bit because um, there's a lot of revelation of it, and it's just a really powerful way to, to evangelize. But anyway, this is why we believe in it, because it works. Yeah, there's, test there's fruit. We look back and see just a, just, just a trail of fruit everywhere. Like, man, it just always works. Thank you, Jesus. Time and time again. Time and time and time again. Good preaching doesn't hurt. The Holy Spirit is a, is a game changer. Though. So, did that anybody have any? So, if anybody would like ministry, now's the time for that.